once upon a midnight dreary, as I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. As I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly I heard a tapping, as if someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Merely this and nothing more. It was October 7th, 1849, and the author of those famous words was dead. Edgar Allan Poe would become one of the most celebrated authors in American history, but his life was a series of tragedies punctuated by bouts of literary genius. And his mysterious death at just the age of 40, and the events that led up to it, deserve to be remembered. He was born in Boston in January of 1809 to two actors, David and Eliza Poe. His father left the year after he was born, and his mother died of tuberculosis the year after that. Poe and his two siblings were adopted by John and Francis Allen of Richmond, Virginia. Allen was a relatively well-to-do tobacco merchant who, upon the death of a rich uncle, inherited an estimated $750,000. That amount of money would be worth $17 million today. Historians have preserved some of Allen's early ledgers, and on the back, Poe was already writing verses, showing his interest in becoming an author and not following in his adopted father's footsteps. In 1826, Poe left Richmond to attend the University of Virginia, leaving behind a sweetheart, Sarah Elmira Royster. Elmira was a 15-year-old neighbor with whom Poe, at age 16, had fallen in love. He wrote Elmira multiple letters from the university, which, according to some, Elmira's family intercepted because they disapproved of the match. They convinced Elmira to marry the wealthy Alexander B. Shelton in 1827. She would remain married until Shelton's death from pneumonia in July 1844. Meanwhile, Poe, who was so broke from gambling and John Allen's refusal to send him further money, was burning his furniture to stay warm at the university. He dropped out and returned to Richmond and learned about his sweetheart's marriage to another man. Poe was, apparently, heartbroken. His relationship with John Allen became more strained, and shortly thereafter he left the Allen home in Richmond. Poe never reconciled with his adopted father, who even left Poe out of his will. But despite this lack of support, Edgar Allan Poe was determined to become a famous author. According to some historians, his first published work, Tamerlane and Other Poems, was inspired by his failed romance with Elmira. In Tamerlane, Poe wrote, I saw no heaven, but in her eyes. He was only 18 years old when it was published. Poe published Tamerlane anonymously as a Bostonian, and only 50 copies were printed. Only a few of these highly sought-after tomes still exist today. He lied about his age to join the military, saying he was 22 years old when he was actually 18, and used a fake name. Edgar Perry. Poe spent two years in the military and obtained the rank of Sergeant Major when he revealed to his commanding officer his deception. He was discharged in order to attend the United States Military Academy at West Point, which some biographies claim he hated. So Poe acted up and was court-martialed after only eight months and kicked out of West Point. But in his brief time there, Poe made friends and fellow cadets lent him money to publish a second book of poems in 1831. He included a dedication to them, which read, to the U.S. Corps of Cadets, this volume is respectfully dedicated. After being booted from West Point, going back to Richmond wasn't an option. John Allen's wife and Poe's adopted mother, Frances, had died a few years previously, and Allen had remarried. Instead, Poe went to Baltimore, Maryland, to stay with his paternal aunt, Maria Clem, and her daughter, Poe's cousin, Virginia, in March 1831. His career started to take a turn for the better when he won a literature contest and was invited to become an editor for the magazine Southern Literary Messenger. Part of Poe's success was due to the fact that he wrote masterful literary reviews, not holding back in his criticisms of other authors, to the delight of the publication's readers. In one of his reviews about a poem Poe disliked, he wrote, A more absurdly flat affair was never before paraded to the world, with so grotesque an air of bombast and assumption. The insulted poet's wife was later to say about Poe, he did not play with his pen, he wielded it. One of the authors Poe offended with his reviews was Rufus Griswold. After Poe's death, Griswold wrote a scathing obituary and followed it up with a biography that portrayed Poe as a hard-drinking womanizer in an effort to permanently blacken Poe's name. According to the Poe Museum of Richmond, Virginia, Griswold's plan backfired and more readers bought Poe's books after the dark biography was published than ever before. But one part of Griswold's biography appears to be true. Edgar Allan Poe did indeed binge drink. 
Some historians claim that Poe temporarily lost his job at the Southern Literary Messenger when he showed up to work inebriated and only got it back after he promised to behave in the future. Author and historian John Walsh, who has written a nonfiction book about Poe called Midnight Dreary, claims Poe was not a drunkard in the way usually meant by the term. He points to the extraordinary writing and editing Poe was able to produce as proof of his sobriety and occasional lapses into binges. Walsh writes, as always with this type of alcoholism, the unsettling fact was its combined certainty and unpredictability. After long periods of perfect sobriety, he seemed almost bound to fail again, and those who cared about him had to live with that relentless expectation. One of the people who cared about him was his first cousin, Virginia, whom Poe married in 1836. Witnesses told authorities Virginia was of age, but she was actually only 13. Poe was more than a decade her senior. Poe's efforts at his new job led to the Southern Literary Messenger becoming one of the most popular magazines in the Southern United States, and he thought his pay was not commiserate with his results. So he left the Messenger and moved north, first living in New York and then Philadelphia, working for different publications, in an effort to earn more money to support himself in Virginia. The literary world was a difficult place to earn a living in the early 1800s. Part of the problem was the lack of an international copyright, protecting the rights and income of authors. American publishers had the unfortunate habit of bootlegging British works rather than paying for original works. Another problem was instability in the business. Publications would spring up and then fall apart almost overnight. Throughout his career, Poe worked for numerous publications and planned to start one of his own. But his dream as a publisher crumbled because he lacked the money to support the venture. After years of struggling, Poe became famous when his classic work, The Raven, was published in January 1845. But he didn't become rich from the success. Historians say he was paid only $9 for the work. But he was able to springboard his fame into a series of rather successful speaking tours, where he'd read aloud from his poetry, and then engage the audiences in question and answer sessions. When Poe's wife Virginia died of tuberculosis in 1847, he went into another tailspin. He found himself unable to ride, and alcohol took front and center stage in his life once more. For a while, he courted a poet named Sarah Helen Whitman, but their relationship fell apart. For her part, Whitman seemed infatuated with Poe before she even met him, writing to a friend, I can never forget the impressions I felt in reading a story of his for the first time. I experienced the sensation of such intense horror that I dared neither look at anything he had written, nor even utter his name. But by degrees this terror took on the character of fascination, and I devoured with a half-reluctant and fearful avidity every line that fell from his pen. Poe, on the other hand, first saw Whitman when he was walking by her rose garden with a friend in 1845. Some historians claim he revised the classic poem to Helen to reflect his experience on seeing Whitman for the first time. Thy hyacinth hair, thy classic face, thy naiad airs have brought me home to the glory that was Greece, and the grandeur that was Rome. Others claim that the only muse for that poem was Helen of Troy. Whitman's mother didn't approve of the relationship between the poet and her daughter, so the couple had to meet in the Providence Library, called the Athenaeum. At one of their clandestine meetings, Whitman asked Poe if he had read Ulalume, which was published anonymously in the American Review. Poe revealed that he had not only read it, but that he was the author. He secretly signed the library's copy of the poem, which the librarians didn't discover until later. Various rumors persist about why Whitman canceled their engagement, but in addition to the opposition of her mother, she was apparently warned about Poe's alcoholism, and an attorney advised her to write a prenuptial agreement to keep her money out of Poe's hands. Whatever happened, they ended their engagement, and Poe returned to Richmond, Virginia. There he resumed his acquaintance with Sarah Elmira Royster Shelton, his childhood sweetheart, who had married a wealthy merchant. Now widowed, Elmira seemed at first reluctant to let Poe back into her life. When he first visited her, after decades away, he showed up on her doorstep on a Sunday morning while Elmira was on her way to church. Later, after Poe's death, she remembered that meeting, saying, I went down and was amazed to see him, but knew him instantly. He came up to me in the most enthusiastic manner and said, Oh, Elmira, is this you? She casually thanked him for his visit and then went to Sunday services. Poe persisted, even though Elmira's two children didn't like the poet. In later years, they would confess to mocking the dark-haired man behind his back. In a letter to a friend, Elmira wrote that Poe asked her to marry him, and when she realized he was serious about it, I told him that if he would not take a positive denial, he must give me time to consider it. He said that love that hesitated was not love for him. But Poe was convinced that she shared his affections. About meeting his former childhood sweetheart, he wrote, 
I am convinced she loves me more devotedly than anyone I ever knew, and I cannot help loving her in return. They tentatively set a wedding date for October 17, 1849, when Poe was scheduled to return from a lucrative editing job up north. On his way out of Richmond, Poe stopped by the Southern Literary Messenger, the publication he used to work for, and gave John Thompson, one of the editors there, a poem. Thompson recalled Poe saying, here's a little trifle that may be worth something to you. When Poe left, Thompson opened the pages and read Annabel Lee for the first time. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. It was to be the last complete poem written by Edgar Allan Poe. He left Richmond September 27th and then was discovered drunk and ill in Baltimore where he died in a hospital on October 7th. The circumstances of his death have been a mystery almost since they occurred. Some contemporaries of Poe claim that he was a victim of cooping, a type of kidnapping used by political parties at the time. In essence, they would snatch men off the streets, keeping them drunk and confined in the days before an election, and then forcing them to vote the way the group wanted them to, in an effort to falsely inflate votes. Proponents of this theory point to the fact that Poe was discovered drunk in a tavern that was being used as an election place, and wearing clothes so worn that they didn't seem to belong to him. Others claim Poe fell off the wagon and then fell victim to alcohol withdrawal called delirium tremens. Untreated victims of delirium tremens can die up to 40% of the time. It is a terrifying way to die, especially for those forced to witness it, as the victim may suffer from seizures and hallucinations like insects under their skin or pink elephants. Poe's symptoms, as described by the doctors who attended him during his last few days, seem to fit the description of delirium tremens. Still other historians, like John Walsh, support a claim that Poe was attacked and left to die by angry relatives of Elmira, furious that she was going to marry a man with no money, a history of women troubles, and a habit of heavy drinking. His last words, according to some nurses, were garbled, but sounded like, Lord help my poor soul. Edgar Allan Poe was only 40 years old when he died. Edgar Allan Poe was buried in a Presbyterian cemetery in Baltimore. Only six mourners attended his funeral. Elmira didn't even know that he had died until she read about it in the newspaper. Though later in life she would refuse to talk about her time with Poe and sometimes deny ever having been engaged to him, one of her first letters to Poe's former mother-in-law described her grief as unbearable. It was the most severe trial I have ever had, and God alone knows how I can bear it. Perhaps Poe's life was best summed up by his obituary in the Richmond newspaper, The Daily Whig. We regret to learn that Edgar Allan Poe, Esquire, the distinguished American poet, scholar, and critic, died yesterday after an illness of some four or five days. This announcement, coming so sudden and unexpected, will cause poignant regret among all those who admire genius and who have sympathy for the frailties so often attending it. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.